Thank you, Helmut, for the introduction. I'm duly embarrassed. Um, thank you also to Christoph and Ariel for the opportunity to be here. Eva, Lena, IT for all the work you do to make the center run. Um, to all of you for showing up at a lunchtime hour. And finally, last but not least, to my fellow fellows um, for sharing this strange experience of communal living and intellectual exchange with me. Okay, so as you know, the Landhaus Fellows, we live in a villa, what are we supposed to call it, Christoph? A beautiful space in the Bavarian countryside where most of us work on incipient book projects. Mine is called Of Mollusks and Men, Diving for Pearls in the Indian Ocean. But the Bavarian countryside is a long way away from any kind of ocean, and certainly the ones I study. But there's another reason, or another way in which being here at the Rachel Carson Center actually puts me quite close to some of the problems I spend most of my time thinking about. Um, I'm thrilled to be at a center named in honor of Rachel Carson, someone who after all trained in what was then known as aquatic biology, worked for the US Fisheries Department, and wrote her first three books after all on the sea, the so-called Sea Trilogy, Under the Sea Wind in 1941, The Sea Around Us in 1951, and The Edge of the Sea in 1955. Carson wrote about different kinds of shores and oceans. She mostly worked on the northeastern seaboard facing the Atlantic, whereas I work on sites like this one. This um, is a painting made about 110 years, maybe, before Carson writes um, The Sea Around Us. And this shore that you can see here is the Gulf of Mannar. So this is the northwestern um, portion of the island of Ceylon in the 19th century. Sri Lanka today sort of close up against um, the South Indian coast. So thinking about tropical waters rather than Carson's Atlantic coast. Um, but I still think this is maybe a useful provocation to think through. So Carson writes in a very specific context of mid 20th century America. As my colleague and one time RCC fellow, Helen Roswodowski writes, Carson writes about the ocean in the moment of sort of Cold War American technological supremacy. The ocean is construed often as a new frontier, similar to the way we talk about space. So here's Carson in the preface to the sea around us. The ocean is a space so unknown, so mysterious, and so vast, and then she continues on. Technology plays a central role in terms of how Carson writes about the sea, and so too does science. And I'll talk a little bit about my work in the history of science here um, over the next 28 minutes. So Carson writes, here I'm quoting again from the edge of the sea, about the remarkable discoveries of the last 10 years which have allowed us to know the sea in very particular ways. And Carson's signal achievement, we all know, is to render science approachable for all of us, to write books that enliven the ocean, that allow us to know the sea. So what I hope I'll convince you in the next 26 minutes today is to ask whether longer prehistories of empire, labor, science, and environment have something to teach us both about the 1950s moment, but also maybe about contemporary ways of meeting the ocean. Oops, sorry. Um, I know we're a diverse group of scholars. We come from different disciplinary formations, varying regional expertise. So to even the playing field a little bit, um, these stories take place in the world of the Indian Ocean. I looked at the LMU history website to see if there were courses taught on the Indian Ocean or the places I study. Sadly, we have not come up with anything. Um, so to give you a brief sketch, the important thing to focus on here is that this is a world in motion. So we're thinking about an oceanic space that isn't sort of blank on the map, but rather one that is animated mostly by the Asian monsoon. So a set of seasonal, predictable annual winds, which push sailors, pilgrims, and traders one way across the ocean and then the other way in a kind of predictable annual pattern. So this is a, a world that we can think of then as being knit together by kinship, religion, belief, political ideologies, systems of labor, and indeed by trade. In the book, I pick up one of the Indian Ocean's trade projects, or trade goods in motion rather, which circulates alongside tea, spices, and silk through both the maritime trade routes of the Indian Ocean as well as its overland trade routes. Those goods are pearls. 
For several thousands of years, the largest sites for the extraction of pearls or the global supply of pearls are sites within this warm, shallow sea. So first and foremost, the Persian Gulf, Khalij al-Farsi in the 19th century, so thinking about Kuwait in the far north, stretching down to Oman, the Gulf of Mannar, which you saw on the painting, and then the Magi Archipelago in extreme southern Burma, Myanmar. Most of you, I presume, will have some intimation of pearls. You might think about magnificent jewelry, sort of objects of elite accumulation and display, like Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney's long chains here. Perhaps you think instead about tiaras and diadems, associations with royalty, like the Raja of Dolpur here. You can see the kind of elaborate headdress. Maybe some of you think not about objects or sort of material histories, but you think about literary associations. I know several of the PhD students work on poetry, on sort of literary approaches. So perhaps when you think of pearls, you're thinking instead of allusions to pearls across poetry, literature, or opera. Fewer of you, however, I think, are likely to begin with pearls and subsequently summon up the sea flow. To when you see images like this one of consumption um, of sort of the finished products of pearls, to bring to mind boring clams or minute parasitic tapeworms burrowing into oyster flesh. To think about sea surface temperatures and water salinity, the millions of fertilized oyster larvae that drift on the surface of the ocean that then have to make successful journeys to adulthood as oysters to produce the goods that eventually become these pearls. We know that from the ancient world into the modern, pearls circulated far. Empires from the Mughal to the Iberian and indeed even the Habsburgs coveted pearls. Here's a photograph I took in Augsburg last weekend with some other Landhaus fellows, um, showing in particular the centrality of pearls and pearling um, to early modern empire. So there's a historian, Molly Wash, who works on the way that pearls become a metonym or a synonym for empire at, at particular moments in time. And here this is, I think, a representation of the Americas. This is a very brief 30-year stint where the Caribbean pearl beds are intensely exploited. Um, and then we, we return to supply from the Indian Ocean. However, despite all of this, my book is not a book about pearls. Um, I think there's a beautiful kind of symmetry with Anwesha's presentation last week, in that Anwesha, who, for those of you who were not present, presented on electronic waste. So the commodity form after its point of use, when it's discarded, where does it end up, where does it go when it no longer has a price tag or a way that you're using it. My own interest in pearls then is sort of pre, um, a precursor to the, the status of the commodity, um, pearl as commodity rather. So before we have pearls, we have oysters. And before merchants or traders enter into commercial deals to sell pearls, divers have to enter, enter the ocean. My research asks how a space on the ocean floor becomes a site of potential economic value. How does an oyster on the seabed with no price tag attached to it become an object for sale or for science? How does the long-standing maritime expertise of seafaring communities come to be seen as unscientific? Um, so I don't have time, obviously, to go over all of the chapters, although I'm happy to talk more in the Q&A. But this is a kind of sample of the types of sources that we might look at if we want to write a history of extraction rather than a history of consumption focused on finished pearls as they circulate around the globe. So from left to right, you can see one of the first plans for a marine biological laboratory, sea surface temperature measurements on the bottom right-hand side, a fisher's petition in Sinhalese on sort of fish being scarce in the water, and on the far left-hand side, um, a transaction, a sort of agreement to deliver a stated quantity of mother of pearl shell between divers and sea captains. So thus far, I hope I've convinced you that a commodity history of pearls is not coeval with an environmental history of pearling. So presuming that you are all convinced of this argument, let's stay with the sea and submerge ourselves a little bit further in its depths. Maybe a caveat here that's important to mention is the market does matter to this inquiry. One of the reasons I've selected these time periods is um, this is a period that sees a vast global uptick in the demand for pearls. So thinking with um, the Vanderbilts and the Raja of Dolpur, for example, we can think about the 19th century as a moment when centers of pearl consumption shift away from Asia. So if you thought of a period before the 1880s, you would think about centers like Bombay and Surat, 
as the center of the world's pearl trade, whereas after the 1880s, you would think instead of New York and Paris. So if you read new newspapers from New York in the early 20th century, most pearls are a better investment to make than gold and diamonds. So there's a real upsurge of interest in, um, in purchasing pearls and in the value assigned to pearls. Um, this is one of the reasons that in 1906, the lead jeweler for Tiffany & Company, the American gem expert George Kunz, muses, how strange is the providence of God who by granting the pearl to the pure, poor Arab, the Tamil of India and the forgotten Selang of Mergi, makes the greatest and the wealthiest in the world contribute to their su support. My articulation then of the book is an attempt to place the Arab, the Tamil and the Selang at the center of how we think about knowledge and expertise on the sea in the 19th century. Those employed as pearl divers across the Indian Ocean are a diverse and heterogeneous group. They range from Bedou in the Arabian Peninsula, enslaved African men and boys from up the Swahili coast working in Khaliji or Gulf fisheries, Tamil and Muslim coastal dwellers in South India, and indigenous boat people from the Magi Archipelago. Um, my fellow fellows at the Landhouse were very confused about the music that was playing um, when you walked in. I don't know if it was loud enough, but this is sort of one example of the rich cultural and social worlds that we might reconstruct around diving communities. So what you were listening to um, is a set of oral histories and sort of um, recreated diving songs from Adar in Bahrain, from a pearling house in Bahrain. Um, okay, here, let's skip through this one. In the book, I argue that these individuals were key actors in the emergence of science, ecology, and law um, as they emerge in the 20th century. At the same time, I'm interested in how these global regimes of law and science at sea both absorb the knowledge of local seafaring communities, but they also perform the discursive work of writing communities' maritime expertise into being unskilled or primitive. So why is it that Carson turns to scientists and not to fishermen when she wants to describe the ocean for us? What particular visions of knowing the ocean do we inscribe at this particular moment in time? Okay, that was a hefty slide and lots of text, which I don't usually do. Um, but really my interest then is in how the divers work and body in terms of meeting the ocean, which you can see on the pearling dao on the left hand side, interacts both with the material of the ocean and how we come to think about its biological, oceanic, ecological and environmental parameters, and in turn how the science that is produced on the ocean also affects regimes of labor um, and power at sea. Okay. Divers in their own, had their own ways of meeting the ocean. I don't have time to go into all of that today. We might think about Khaliji divers, that's Gulf pearl divers, describing particular pearl beds as being noble or ignoble. Ship captains writing about the different conditions of the ocean flow and sea currents. Um, Tamil divers giving a different name to every single reef out at sea, um, which described particular animal, biological, or environmental features of each reef. Um, Oysters, in turn, also have their way of knowing the ocean or of responding to human agents at sea, in particular engaged in the practice of fishing. So here you can see, sorry, the, um, the colors aren't very clear. So here what I've done is tabulated um, data from the Ceylon pearl fishery. I mean, one, one point to make is that these kinds of archives are very revealing about historic oceans. They give us quite fine-grained data if we want to trace environmental change back into time. Um, this data is so fine-grained because the pearl fishery of Ceylon is run as a colonial monopoly. So all three sites that I study fall under loose ambit of the British Empire in the late 19th century. And here in the context of Ceylon, the state sends out divers to harvest oysters. Once the oysters are brought back onto shore, they're counted and divided up very, very precisely. The colonial state then takes three quarters of the catch and sells it and the profit sort of accrues to the colonial state in Ceylon. Which means that we can plot fairly accurately how many oysters are being lifted from the seafloor. And you can see here they're bunched into sort of periods of very um, extensive or intensive fisheries followed by periods of inactivity. 
What this leads to is a situation where the oyster comes to be construed as a sort of unreliable agent in the business of fishing. So colonial powers muse over, I quote, the periodic disappearance of the oyster from certain banks. Until 1906, writers writing in English um, hazard that there is some mysterious and hitherto unexplained reason why there are insufficient numbers of oysters on the banks. So colonial science, or science with a capital S, enters these oceans with the intention of remedying the problem of oyster yield, so to so, try to translate the oyster into a more um, reliable um, pearl producing agent. Again, I'm just sticking with Ceylon, although we could kind of talk comparatively if people were interested. Um, the first scientific report, and here I'm also using an actor's category, so this is the way that science is written about in, in the archives, um, comes under the tenure of Governor Henry Ward in a commission given to a Ceylonese burger sur surgeon naturalist Edward Kalat in 1857, he writes a report on the natural history of the pearl oyster of Ceylon. Kalat heralds his report as being the first modern scientific report on the oyster. And if you read, say, histories of malacology, that's the study of oysters, if you are so moved to do so, then these are the kinds of sort of starting points for ocean science or for thinking about invertebrates in the 19th century that you would locate as bookends. If we read more broadly in Tamil and Arabic literature, we might find a whole host of other ways of thinking about creatures in the ocean and about different relationships between these creatures. What I want to pay attention to here is the way that expertise about submarine testimony is being formed. So Kailat writes, no naturalist has ever had the same opportunity of observing the habits of the pearly mollusk as I have had at present. So the important point to note here is that in the 19th century, in all three pearl fisheries, no European enters below the space of the waves. So this is a very specific form of labor that pearl divers are undertaking to procure specimens for science. Here we might want to think, yeah, sorry, we can think again about predictable trans-imperial networks of oyster science, which then circulate. This is a document on the oyster of Ceylon, which circulates to the Khaliji or Gulf context and to the Burmese context. Um, we can think about twin technologies of the 19th century, the microscope and the camera, which fix the oyster, sort of render the oyster in new ways, apart from divers' lived working experiences meeting oysters at sea. To give you just a sense, this is one of the major um, marine biological reports undertaken on the Indian Ocean. Again, still forms a starting point for thinking about marine biology in this space. So this is a report undertaken by William Herdman and an assistant, James Hornell, um, on the pearl fishery in the Gulf of Mannar. What happens is that interest around the oyster then spirals into a broader inquiry into the ocean and ocean life. So we can think my crude copy paste here of a whole set of other sea creatures that get pulled into the ambit of science. So there's a whole set of other disciplines that emerges out of the study of the pearl oyster on the Indian Ocean's marine flora and fauna. We might be interested also to observe the different ways that sea life gets written up normatively. So here you have, if the intention here is to increase the number of pearl oysters so that we have more pearls to trade, then there is a concurrent process of writing up friends and enemies of the pearl-bearing oyster. So you can see here two enemies. Um, in addition, I, I think the starfish is, is labeled the sort of arch enemy, and then there's a concerted program of culling starfish across the northern Indian Ocean, against, again circulating on um, trans-imperial networks. Oops, excuse me. My interest then here is in how one meets the material of the ocean and how one makes sense of it. So I mentioned that divers are required to bridge the gap. If the bottom of the ocean flow is inaccessible to science at the start of the 19th century, if it's a sort of unknown space, divers are crucial to retrieve or procure specimens for these kinds of scientific disciplines to emerge and coalesce. So this chart, I think, is a very useful way of thinking with, um, thinking with what it means to make the floor of the ocean known. 
So this is an inspection chart. It would be distributed on the decks of pearling vessels with helmsmen on the vessels. There would be maybe 10 to 5 divers per inspection boat. And you can see here, so on average, a diver might make, in certain instances, a single boat might make about 200 dives on a single space on the ocean floor. And then you can see how the experience of meeting the ocean is written up and abstracted. So here, numbers in circles indicate old oysters. Plain numbers indicate young. An X is spat, so sort of um, oyster larvae, too numerous to count. A triangle for flat rock, a double forward slash for living coral, a single dot for sand, and a forward slash for weed. So you can see, again, how sort of embodied immersionary work is then translated or abstracted into statistical renderings of the seafloor. And as historians who are based in these archives, sort of reading these documents, we don't have to remain with abstracted scientific schema. So we might cross-read a document like this one against, say, medical reports from the fisheries. We might think about divers complaining that coral and rocks cut their hands and feet, that they bleed from the nose and eardrums, that they report problems with their lungs, skin disease, and so on and so forth. So we can sort of cross-read the archives of labor against the archives of science to allow us to move towards a fuller picture of what it means to bring the stuff of the sea into scientific discourse. This is um, another example. So we talked about immersionary work of divers. This is one of the first submarine maps of the Persian Gulf seafloor. If you look now, the Gulf seafloor is sort of one of the seafloors we know best, primarily because there's oil deposits. Um, but at this point, this is the first attempt cartographically, as far as I know, to render the bottom of the ocean floor. But producing this kind of imperial documentation is always reliant on local intermediaries and specialist community knowledge. So here we might think about, and this is just one example of a sort of very, very large corpus. This is a Bahraini Nakoda, or ship captain, writing a guide to the pearl oyster beds. And we can think about these much longer legacies of celestial navigation, of reading the shoreline, and reading the bottom of the ocean. So Alam al-Bahar. Um, what is ocean science, or when do we designate certain kind, regimes of knowledge to be science with a capital S on the ocean? Another interesting um, process to trace, since I'm vested in the question of who becomes an expert on the sea, um, this notion of expertise is emerging both at the same time that we see a professionalization of science, its incorporation into the universities, as well as the institutionalization of particular scientific disciplines. So 100 years before Rachel Carson writes, we're thinking about natural history, it splinters into zoology. Certainly, this is sort of maybe nascent formations of disciplines like ecology or marine biology, oceanography, and so on and so forth. Alongside the classification of oysters, their reproductive capacities, interior composition, internal anatomy, so some of the oyster photographs that you saw earlier, is a similar process of taxonomy applied to those who are doing the work of diving for pearls. So we can think about marine biology as increasingly integrated with a discipline of scientific racism. Here, the, this is um, a text authored by James Hornell, who took both the photographs that I have on the backdrop slide as well as the photographs of oysters. Um, and Hornell was particularly invested both in tracking oyster growth and repair and size, et cetera, with making the same kinds of measurements for those who labored at the fisheries. So in this instance, there are four racial groups with different aptitudes for diving at sea. Arabs are far ahead of the others in endurance, their time underwater being generally 70 to 85 seconds. Um, this particular report, which is included with the marine biological results, has reports on sort of blood dilution, intermarriage, um, other kinds of, kinds of measurements. A concurrent stream of European writing on the fisheries turns the diver into something closer to a fish. So we have records of black skin sharing away, scaring away sharks, Tamils as being amphibious, Africans as being lusty divers, fill in the blanks, you, you can do the work. Um, I guess this is, a way, this is a way of saying that there is a politics to how we know the ocean and who we designate a legitimate expert on the ocean. 
Um, this kind of scientific publication then filters back into the labor dynamics of the fishery. This is one of my favorite sources. Um, I presume we don't have Tamil readers. Maybe Nandita can read with me. Um, but here we have one of hundreds of lists of ship, um, <coughs> ship crews going out to sea in the Gulf of Mannar. But if you read the names, these are not Tamil or Muslim divers from the Gulf. Ali Abdulaziz, Salim Muhammad, Abdullah Saeed, Suppu. Um, these are Khaliji divers coming from places like Kuwait, Qatar, and Bahrain to work in Sri Lanka as a result of scientific publications like Hornell's. So this is another way of saying just as labor goes into producing the kinds of science on the Indian Ocean, science filters back into the dynamics of labor at the pearl fisheries, displacing certain local communities and enabling others to find employment. Okay, I'll give a final example before I wrap up. I have like four minutes. Um, I hope that you have a sense that the sort of scientific archive on the ocean that emerges out of this period is a pretty rich one. It enables us to know the ocean in, in very specific and I think sometimes useful ways. I think, however, that we want to always be careful about cross-contextualizing and cross-reading these sources. Um, in a way, this is maybe my frustration with say marine historical ecologists who read documents about the material or animal life on the sea <coughs> fairly uncritically. So I'll give you just one example before I wrap up. Um, on the morning of the 7th, 7 a.m. on the morning of the 11th of April, 1877, 51 fishing vessels are assembled out at sea, ready to continue diving for pearls. Several million oysters have already been retrieved and killed off. They're left to rot on, um, on the shore of the Gulf of Mannar before their flesh is sorted through by women and children, largely, to search for the seed pearls for which Ceylon was famous. At this point in time, colonial officials supervising the monopoly in the fishery of Ceylon are already having a sense that divers are not working to their full capacity. So there is a sense that labor is sort of trying to skive off um, work. A few hours later, James Donnan, who is a colonial official, notes that an alarm is sounded on one of the fishing boats and all the divers stop work for the day. He sends sailors out to find out what is wrong and is told a large shark had been seen, <laughs> a large shark had been seen on the bottom of the ocean floor by divers in boat number five. He insists, however, that the shark is made up. It's a sort of myth that divers are using to avoid working that day. He brings a whole series of seafaring men and women before him, and they corroborate this testimony. Reports arrive of a huge monster, 15 feet long, very large in girth, a large tiger shark about four fathoms long with an enormous head that churns up the water. There are a whole series of shark descriptions, but that's probably enough for one day. Um, we know that the Gulf of Mannar has a whole set of sharks that inhabit the reefs. There's a number of Tamil words that we might use for different types of sharks. Um, but here my interest really is, whatever the reason for the shark's own patterns of mobility, the shark morphs into a labor negotiation, a bargaining chip, a piece of evidence, either for the timidity of local communities looking only to skive off work, or as a way that divers can sort of creatively manipulate their privileged access to the seafloor. So the ocean, in other ways, I'm trying to argue, is not a space that is culturally empty. Divers' ideas about labor and danger, as well as the racialized colonial logics of the undersea, construct different visions of the ocean. And then the choice when we read contemporary scientific publications backwards on who to listen to is a deeply political one, I think. OK, with one minute to go, I'm going to wrap up. Here's Carson again from the edge of the sea, or the sea around us, I'm not sure. Um, I quote, I believe popular books about the ocean are written from the viewpoint of a human observer. They record his impressions and interpretations of what he saw. Carson continues, in this book, I was determined to avoid this human bias as much as possible. I decided that the author as a person and human observer should never enter the story, but it should be told as a simple narrative of the lives of certain animals of the sea. As far as possible, I wanted my readers to feel that they were, for a time, actually living the lives of sea creatures. Oops. I hope that after listening to some snippets of stories from the book project, perhaps you have a slightly different take 
on how we might approach the question of the human in relation to the form and material of the ocean. I leave you with this image from the archives. I think this is a fairly violent image um, to confront. This image comes from William Herdman's um, expeditions on the Indian Ocean. It is um, a staged photograph. So the, um, in the process of studying oysters, as I mentioned, a whole other set of sea creatures are studied. In the dredge nets one day, they pull up a remora. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's a kind of sucker fish that exists in symbiotic relationship to sharks and other marine creatures. And here the fish is attached um, onto a pearl diver's back to demonstrate um, suction capacities of the fish. So I think this photograph in relation to Carson is maybe helpful to, to prompt us to think about constructing notions of the animal or the material of the sea that were themselves dependent on human regimes of racialized work and the politics of labor in place. What if rather than the hubris of taking humans, anthropos, out of the ocean altogether, science is giving us a picture of nature out there that we somehow leave out there. We think about these kinds of relationships as being relational. And I think the history of science and labor archives are sort of good ways to push us towards doing this. If we see marine biology, this sort of subsequently abstracted, reduced statistics, as built on knowledge that was initially embodied intimate and firsthand, sort of very much rooted in human politics and problems. The stories of mollusks and men, in other words, were very much entangled. Thank you.